Hi, this is Rabbi Tobin, and this is December 9th, 2019, and we are in Chapter 4 of Sanhedrin, as we have been, and it seems like we may forever be. All right, pass this down, please. Herb, down to... There you go. All right. In the Schottenstein, we are on 35B2. And we are about to, yes. Very interesting. The uh, other rabbi yesterday was giving us, uh, co you know, comedian, uh, and they were satirical Talmudic. <laughs> it was very, it was very interesting. Let's see if I can find someone. Where do we get our sign behind us? That's the best way. Sorry for all that. Something like that. Um, okay, 35 B2. All right. Having provided a biblical source to prove that the mitzvah of execution does not override Shabbat laws, the Gemara wants to derive another law. So remember, our question was, can you execute on Shabbat? The main problem not being the killing, but the burial. Because digging a hole in the ground is forbidden on Shabbat. Hanging a corpse overnight is also forbidden by Torah law. So, I mean, the actual act, the actual act of the execution can be Well, done. by definition, a noose is not a permanent knot, so you can tie an impermanent knot. But they didn't hang by the neck until dead. That wasn't, they, this is a fairly gruesome thing. But the w different ways that they executed people is not what you think. Stoning wasn't stoning. Hanging wasn't hanging. Uh, stoning was being... Uh, either dropped on stones or crushed by large boulders. And uh, hanging was actually a kind of strangulation with ropes rather than actually hanging from some gallows or branch. Uh, burning was not burning at the stake. It was molten iron or down your throat, um, which would get you from the inside out. Uh, lots of horrible, horrible ways to murder somebody or to execute somebody. Um, all meant, of course, to stop people from wanting to put themselves in that position. The, and subsequently, because rabbis are nice people too, they created a legal system that made it very hard for us to convict somebody to have those things happen. And nobody wants those things to happen. Um, okay, so Abaye says, Amar Abaye, Hashta de Amrat, Ein Ritzicha Dochat Shabbat. Now that you have said that murder does not override Shabbat laws, in other words, the killing by the court, not exactly murder, which is an unjustified extrajudicial killing, but the ju judicial killing. You could also derive that the execution of a murder doesn't override the sacrificial service from a kol v'chomer. Remember, kol v'chomer is, if we know something in this case, which is relatively simple, how much the more so it would be in another case, which is more strict. That's a kol v'chomer. So he's saying, since you've said that it doesn't override Shabbat, we could say that it doesn't override the sacrificial service. The kol v'chomer being Shabbat, which has lots of things that break it, lots of ways that you can have to do something on Shabbat that's forbidden, but for a good reason, like a bris, for example. Um, the avodah service, the sacrificial service in the, in the sanctuary, in the temple, cannot be interrupted, right? That's like literally sacramount. It is the most important thing that happens in the society. So um, if you can't break Shabbos for an execution, obviously, the Kol V'chomer would say, the logic would say, you shouldn't interrupt the avodah service for it. But let's see what Abai is doing here. So he says, now that you've stated a murderer does not override Shabbat laws, um, you, you should also say that the execution of the murderer does not override the sacrificial service because of a kol v'chomer that goes like this. Uma Shabbat need chet mibne avodah, since Shabbat, which is less stringent, is overridden by the sacrificial service, en resicha duchaota, and the execution is not done on Shabbat. Avodah shehi docha Shabbat, how much the more so that the Avodah service, which can break Shabbat, um, should in turn not be broken because of the murderer. Next page, 35b3. Ein odin shalot tehei ritzicha docha ota. Isn't it logical that the murderer should not override that as well? 
Ella, rather, Abaye says, Hadichtiv, um, but that which is written, Me'in Mizbechi, even from my altar you shall take him to execute him, which is a Torah law regarding the, the murderer. Hahu lekor ban yachid delo dachi shabbat. Um, that verse only refers, re- refers to a private sacrifice which does not override Shabbat. All right, so what's the logic? The logic is this. We know that there's a case in the Torah where it, which is found in, in the laws of the accidental murderer, the person who didn't plan to murder somebody but killed someone by accident. That person flees to a city of refuge. The city of refuge is centered around the Levites and the sacrificial system in those cities. So there's this concept that it's sanctuary. It's like in a game of tag, it's home base. If you can be in contact with the city of refuge, you can be in contact with the altar, you can be in the sacrificial service, they can't grab you and take you out and kill you for killing their relative. The blood avenger has no rights if you're there. But there is a case in the Torah that says, but if he did it on purpose, even from my altar you shall take him, blood for blood, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, etc., you, justice shall be exacted upon him. So even from my sanctuary you shall take him. So Abaye says, you know, I got a call for Homer. We've just proven that you don't execute the murderer on Shabbat because it doesn't break Shabbat. And the Avodah service we know breaks Shabbat because they're lighting fires and sacrificing animals there on Shabbat in the days the temple was happening. So how much the more so you wouldn't break the Avodah service for him. However, we have a Torah verse that says you do break the Avodah service to execute him. Ella, except that verse, is only talking about a private sacrifice, not the actual stuff that breaks Shabbat. So if I bring my own private sacrifice to the temple and I want to sacrifice it, I can do that during the week. I can't do that on Shabbat. My private sacrifice to God cannot be given on Shabbat. The only thing that can be given on Shabbat is the Shabbat sacrifice commanded by God. So in other words, what would I do? I just killed somebody. It's Shabbat. I'm running like heck from the blood avenger. And so I know they can't execute me on Shabbat. They're certainly not going to interrupt the Abu Dhabi service. So I grab a goat and I run with me to the sanctuary and I proceed to pretend to be offering a private sacrifice to say you can't take me away because you can't break the Avodah service. I'm going to use the Kol V'chomer when I bring my goat to the temple to keep them from grabbing me because I know there's a Kol V'chomer out there that says since it doesn't work on Shabbos, it certainly wouldn't interrupt the Avodah service. And Abaye is answering that little logical chicanery by saying the private sacrifice that the murderer might have dragged along with him doesn't work because it doesn't break Shabbat. Therefore, it's not a kol v'chomer that you shouldn't break the Avodah service. So you can break the Avodah service. And you take him away and you can execute him. Everyone just having fun with that? Just out of curiosity. Just out of curiosity, the man says. Go ahead. Why don't they wait till Sunday? <laughs> well, because you have a mitzvah to kill the guy. You don't want to wait till Sunday. It's your mitzvah to kill him. <laughs> or you might change your mind, or the judges might read the record wrong. Once, okay. <laughs> once you have an obligation in the Torah, you're not supposed to wait. Why do we bury after a day no more than two? Why don't we wait until next Tuesday when everybody can be in town? Because you have a mitzvah to bury them. You have to bury them right away. <laughs> Avodah means the animal sacrificial service. Every oh, form of animal avodah. sacrifice avodah. is called avodah. Okay. No. No, the, the word avodah is a homonym in oh. Hebrew. One meaning of it is work. One meaning of it is sacrificial service. It's, 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 there's, a, there's a song or a prayer that's got avodah in it. Boker bala avoda. Yeah. Boker, 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 ba, boker bala avoda, boker bala avoda, boker bala avoda. Boker, boker, ba. I think you're talking, you're not talking about sacrifices in that one. No, that would be a secular kibbutz song of getting people up in the morning to go to work. That's the avoda party in Israel, it's the labor party. Right. 
It doesn't mean the animal sacrifice party. I don't think I don't think David Ben Gurion would have joined the animal sacrifice party. Bibi would. Bibi might, but he's a Likudnik. That's how you can get a unity government. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, that's it. yeah any, anybody who's just heard that joke about the unity government and is watching this a year or two from now, you have to go back and Google December 2019 <laughs> Israeli elections yeah. and see what that joke is. Okay. Because now there'll be the March 2nd Israeli elections. The third round of elections is going to happen on March 2nd. Oh, well, they get three months to plan. You can do it four times in a year if you really get your act together. All right, moving on. Uh, when you have a baye, you often have rava, and this is no different. The Gemara will object. Amar rava, ihachi lo korban yachid mikol v'chomer. Rava says, oh yes, smarty pants? If your logic is correct, then the a private sacrifice, right? The murderer does not, the murder should not override the private sacrifice because of this kol v'chomer. What's my kol v'chomer, Rava says? Page 36a. Mayom, mayom tov shenid chem ipnei korban yachid, if the yom tov law is less stringent, it is overridden by a private sacrifice, and resichad duchao tov, and nevertheless, the execution of the murderer does not override yom tov, korban yachid shehu duchad yom tov, a private sacrifice which overrides yom tov, ain odin shelo tehei resichad duchao tov, should the law not be that the murderer should not override it. So Rava is going to try and do a logical thing here to say that the um, execution should... Um, let me get this straight. Private is more stringent. Is it not logical that the should not override? That the execution should not override the private sacrifice. So what happened at the end of Abaye was um, execution, the private sacrifice does not protect you from execution. The logic being that the private sacrifice does not break Shabbat, and um, if it doesn't break Shabbat, it certainly wouldn't break an avodah that breaks Shabbat, but this is an avodah that doesn't break Shabbat. Therefore, you can't learn it from Shabbat. So now Rav is going to try and learn it from Yom Tov where a private korban does override Yom Tov. So you bring a private sacrifice on Yom Tov, it's okay. They'll do it. Yeah, it's not a good argument. It's just his argument. Okay, so here we go. Let's see how it works in the language. Ma Yom Tov shenid chem ipnei korban yachid, inasmuch as Yom Tov is broken or pushed aside in the face of a private sacrifice, Nevertheless, the execution of a murderer does not override Yom Tov law. Korban Yachid shehu dochad Yom Tov, but the Korban Yachid that does uh, push aside Yom Tov, okay, Korban Yachid being more stringent because it does override Yom Tov, is it not logical that the execution of murder should not override it? So instead of saying is, we're going to say not. So let's let's do the logic, because I'm seeing blind faces in front of me. Let me put it on the board. Okay, you ready? Okay, the Gemara is less strict. Okay, I'm using the less than sign for math. For strict, right. is less strict because personal sacrifice overrides it. Okay, so Yom Tov is not super strict because a personal sacrifice can override it. Nevertheless. If execution does not does does not override it, okay, 
since execution does not override Yom Tov, then with regarding a private sacrifice, which is more stringent, because it does override Yom Tov, isn't it logical that the murderer should not override it? Okay? So you have, in order of strictness, you have Yom Tov here, you have personal sacrifice here. This is going more strict. Okay, this is the arrow of more strict. So Yom Tov is here and personal sacrifice is there. It's more strict. Execution does not override Yom Tov. So where would you put it? Over here. Execution does not override Yom Tov. So it's less strict than that. So shouldn't it be logical that execution is also less strict than personal sacrifice and therefore should not override personal sacrifice? Everyone see it on the board? Okay, so in the language, Yom Tov is overridden by personal sacrifice and nevertheless execution does not override Yom Tov, then isn't it logical that execution should not override personal sacrifice. Would Shabbat be after Shabbat? Okay, so that's that's Robin. Let's do a baye. You want me to do the same thing for a baye? Sure. Let's go back a page. And a baye's kolvachomer works like this. A baye says a murderer execution does not override Shabbat, right? Abayah says, you just proved that to me very well. Execution does not override um, Shabbat, okay? Then you should also derive that a murder execution does not override the Avodah because Shabbat, which is less stringent than Avodah, Shabbat, which is less stringent than Avodah, because Avodah can override Shabbat, how much the more so execution should not override Avodah, but you have a verse that says the personal sacrifice is like here. It does not override Avodah, Right? Regarding this, so you have the verse that says, but it is written for my altar to take it to die. That's a personal sacrifice, which also does not override Shabbat. So according to Abaye, you would have said, right? Right. And you had to deal with the fact that you had a verse that said you break a certain Avodah for execution, but that's the personal sacrifice execution. For a, you can't use that verse to prove anything from the logic of the Shabbat Avodah relationship. The Shabbat Avodah relationship is communal. So you can't learn anything from that as far as the personal, which is what a murderer is. All right? So with Avaya, you wind up having the personal sacrifice here before Shabbat and Avodah. For Rava, you have the personal sacrifice up here. Okay, so Rava, the personal sacrifice is more strict than Yom Tov, and right? right, and then execution is back here. Right. For Abaye, the personal sacrifice is less strict than Shabbat, and then the execution is back here. So you wind up with execution not trumping personal sacrifice in either case. So Abaye and Rava are kind of coming to the same place, but they're coming at it with different examples. Right? Rava is coming at it from Yom Tov. Abaye is coming at it from Shabbat. By the way, the idea of breaking or not breaking Yom Tov hasn't been proven to us. Shabbat, we just did a whole page on it. Uh, Rava just gets brought in here because of bias time. All right, are we better? Not a hundred percent, but we're better. What would you do today? Where there's no sacrifices other than prayer. Um, 
What do we do today when there's no sacrifices other than prayer? Well, we continue to learn the logic of it. Today we would not execute on Shabbat because we learned from the sacrifices that we shouldn't. The fact that we don't do them anymore doesn't mean anything because we know from the logic of them that we're not supposed to sacrifice on Shabbat. There's a lot of stuff in Judaism that we've learned the halakha because we know about the sacrificial system. The reason we're not, not being able to do it doesn't eliminate the value system and the relationship of them in the value system. Especially if you're going to cook cooking with Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, okay. Rava is will, now going to explain his objection, um, which we kind of already took apart, but okay. He's going to say, It's understandable, according to the one who holds it, vowed offerings and donated offerings, which are private, may not be offered on Yom Tov. So private sacrifice are not offered on Yom Tov. Yes, that does make sense with our chart, right? However, Ella, Laman de Mar Nidarim Nidavot Kravim be Yom Tov, but the person who holds that they are offered on Yom Tov, Mi'ika um, Lamemar. What would he say? Since according to his opinion, we have a call of Homer to prove that executions cannot override private offerings or communal offerings. So in other words, there's somebody out there, it's not Rava, who actually would put the Yom Tov on the other side of private offerings. Okay? So then what would happen? If private sacrifice overrides Yom Tov, then it's more strict. And if you can't execute on Yom, execute on Yom Tov, you obviously can't execute on private uh, to interrupt the Avodah service. But if private sacrifice is less strict than Yom Tov, and you can't execute on Yom Tov, what does that tell you about taking away from private sacrifice? Nothing. Right? You don't have a call to Homer anymore to know whether or not you can execute in the middle of a private sacrifice. That's not been proven. So he says, what would that person say? The person who, unlike me, thinks that private sacrifice is less strict than Yom Tov, what are you going to tell him about executing? Have, can we learn anything? All right? Because over here, Abaya was able to do it when he said private sacrifice is less than Shabbat, but that's only because we already knew Shabbat is forbidden to sacrifice. So he could learn a logic from that because of the Avodah and the Shabbat and so forth. Okay, so what's going to happen? Ella, Amar Rava. So Rava says, I'll solve it this way. Lo mi bai laman de amar nidarim and nidavot krevim biyom tov. It goes without saying that one who says that vowed and donated offerings are offered on yom tov, private sacrifices are offered on yom tov, right? Yom tov is less strict than them. De ha lo mit kayem meim mizbeche klal because the verse mandating that a Kohen be removed from near my altar is not applicable at all, because it's a private person, not the Kohen who's doing it, so it's a different case. Ella afil lamanda amar nedarim nevot and kravim biyom tov, but even the person who says that vowed and donated offerings are not offered on yom tov, a kol v'chomer still cannot be used to prevent executions from overriding communal offerings. Footnote 6, okay? That is, according to the view of this time, a buyer's logic could not be used to infer that executions do not override sacrificial service of a private offering. Okay, a buyer's logic cannot be used to learn that executions do not override sacrificial offerings, right? Because a buyer's logic has sacrifice, sacrifice not overruling, a sacrifice overruling Shabbat. So you can't learn that the executions do not override Shabbat, okay? Um, since they do override Yom Tov. So if you can't use a body's logic, if you think personal sacrifices are getting execution is undermining something here in a body's line, then the, the logic tree is off. But we're talking about a body saw that by saying these are communal sacrifices, not personal. 
But if you're saying it's actually personal, a bias line isn't going to work. Because in fact, this does nullify that, and then you could use, right? The, lo the logic tree doesn't work anymore. So what's he going to say? So it is written from near my altar, interpreted to convey, my altar is special to me. What sacrifice is special? The Tamid offering. So in other words, the fact that it was Mizbechi, that it's from my altar, God says. He doesn't say from the altar. It means it's my special altar or my special offering. And which one is that? That's the Tamid specifically. From That's why he said, from near my altar you shall take him to put him to death. So it's only the communal uh, Tamid daily offering that would fall into the line of logic, not personal offerings. So you can't learn anything from personal offerings in the logic tree because the verse is only talking about a communal offering. You'll be happy to know that the Gemara is going to drop that. Okay? Basically, the bottom line is you're not going to execute on Shabbat and you're not going to execute on Yom Tov. And part of what's going on in this chapter, however, is they're very worried about how we're using proof texts. Okay? And they're using proof texts for logic a lot because they're talking about things for which you don't have a clear verse. So you have to take the verse and apply some logic to it to come up with the halacha. And what makes it a little more tortured is we all know what the halacha is before we do that. So you have to take the verse and apply it with logic that's prejudiced towards an outcome. Yeah. Yeah, you have a Yom Tov command um, to rejoice that you don't have on Shabbat. Should, should you, well, it's imbued with happiness. You're not commanded like Lachagog to be to 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 festivate to steal something from Steinfeld, Seinfeld. Right? You're, you're not commanded to festivate on Shabbat, but on a festival you are. Purim does not break Shiva because it's not a Yom Tov. You, but you can go to work. And you can handle money because the Matanot Lev Yonim and, and the Half Shekel for the Yonim. Yeah, no, it's a joyous day, but it's not a Yom Tov. Hanukkah is not a Yom Tov either. <laughs> right. Well, Hanukkah happened too late to get into the Bible. It's a sequel. All right, Gemara moves on to the next ruling of the Mishnah. In judging monetary cases and cases of Tuma and Tahara, who has the Mishnah? Didn't I hand something? Here's the Mishnah. All right, so getting, you'll be happy to know, we're getting almost to the end of this sprawling Mishnah from the beginning of Chapter 4. <laughs> Thirty-two A one. Are you in the, my book? Thirty-two A one is the Mishnah. Thirty-two A Yeah. Thirty-two A two. The end of the Mishnah. You don't have it in front of you. We're going to read it. Thirty-two A two. So we just finished. Therefore, trials are held neither on the eve of Shabbat nor on the eve of Yom Tov. Now, because we can't bury on either day. So all the logic games were really meant to just try and affirm the Mishnah as we had it. The, back in the Mishnah, monetary cases, as well as cases of Tuma and Tahara, we begin with the big guy. <clears throat> Excuse me, we begin with the big guy. But nefashot matchilin min hatsad. But in capital cases, we begin from the side. Everybody's eligible to judge monetary cases. But not all are eligible to judge capital cases. Only Kohanim, Leviim, and Yisraelim who are eligible to marry the daughters of Kohanim. Okay, so our piece is going to be that monetary cases, Tuma and Tahara cases, 
you begin with the most eminent judge and capital cases you begin way off to the side. So you have to picture that there's 23 judges. They're all sitting across in a panel like this listening to the case and the head judge is in the middle and then moving out to the outside are the less and less and less senior judges. And in a money case, or if it's just about purity and impurity of stuff, which really is a money case, because pure wheat has a higher value on the market than impure wheat, um, the guys in the middle are going to speak first. What's going to happen when the guys in the middle, I'm sorry, on a monetary case, there's only three judges, but you still have the most eminent one in the middle. Capital cases, you have 23 judges, and they say you start with the people all the way on the outside talking. Why? So they don't influence anybody else. So they don't influence. You know, once you hear the, <laughs> once the head of the yeshiva speaks, who's going to contradict him? Right? All right. So that's what we're on. So the Gemara moves to the next ruling and it says, Dinei ma'manot hatum ot vatarot, etc. An incident is related. Okay, Amar Rav. Rav says, An havai be minyana devei rabbi. I was in a vote. Minyan here is from the word to count. A minion is a counting of 10 people. So I was in a, a, a vote in Rebbe's court, and Rebbe is Yehuda Nasi, the editor of the Mishnah. And they began deliberating and hearing from me first. So he was in a Beitin of three with the great Rebbe Yehuda Nasi. And they said, hey, Rav, what do you think about it? Instead of speaking from the Gadol first. So how can that possibly be when it's Rabbi Yudha Nasi who said, we begin with the Gadol? Okay? But we have learned in our Mishnah, you begin with the most eminent. Obviously not him. 36A2. Gemara answers. Amar Rabba bere de Rava itema Rabbi Hillel bere de Rav Valis. Um, Rabba the son of Rava, but some think it's Hillel the son of Valis. Doesn't matter. Said here's the answer. Shani minyana deve Rabbi votes in Rabbi's court were different. The hu hu minyanai hu min hatzad havu matchale, because all the votes there started from the side. So there was a unique custom in Rebbe's court where he had everything start from the least and go up to the most. It's just what he did. It's not much of a rule if the most prominent court in the nation doesn't follow it. It's not much of a rule if the author of the rule doesn't follow it, which is what's happening here. All right. Well, you'll be happy to know the Gemara now digresses to, oh, no. to cite another. <laughs> it's so uncharacteristic. Yeah, really, I, <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's the the editor had a hard job. The the editors of the of the Talmud had a lot of material in front of them, and they just had the the scrapped file folders and notebooks of students over a couple of hundred years. And they had to try and find the best gems and jewels and recordings from, you know, the senior seminars and the research projects and, and the unvoted on dissertations that are populating the back shelves of the yeshiva to put it all together so that all of the learning on a topic is present in the Talmud so that when they send it out to the provinces, the people out there are able to learn all the different voices that were involved in trying to figure out Mishnah. And all this without a crazy computer. And without a computer that could piece it all together for them. Right? right? So it's all done by hand. So they're so they're they're putting they're, I'm picturing a room like this, and they're putting over here piles of everything that have to do with courts, and over here piles of everything that have to do with women. And over there, piles of everything having to do with agriculture. And unfortunately, every once in a while, there's a woman who brings an agricultural case to court. And so they get a scribe to write three copies of that. And they put one here, one here, one there. And then you've got somebody who's going to take that pile. And he's got the Mishnah. And he's going to try and draw. He's going to now put a 
Mishnah here, a Mishnah here, a Mishnah here, a Mishnah here. He's going to take his pile and he's going to deal them out like sorting suits in a deck of cards. And he's going to say, this, these teachings fit best with that Mishnah. These teachings fit best with that Mishnah, these to that. And now I'm going to go in and I'm going to actually write them down one after the other after the other. But they have something to do with each other. So I'm going to put little logic bridges between them and say, well, Abaye said this, but Rava said this about that, which is why we do blah, blah, blah. New heading, next Mishnah, because I ran out of stuff in the pile. Right? And everyone's like, you've got stuff that doesn't neatly fit in a pile. And you got to figure out where to put that, which is the dumping ground at the end of every chapter, where you get legends and stories and all kinds of crazy stuff. When you're in the heavens, you get about six chapters down, and somebody says, wait, I got another one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, there, there is some understanding in Talmudic scholarship, kind of forensic Talmudic scholarship, that has tried to do a timeline of when the tractates were edited one after another after another. Because some tractates clearly are aware of other tractates, and some there's places where you would have expected them to bring something in, and they don't. But it gets quoted elsewhere. So you try and, so when you do have a sugya, like I just said, they wrote three copies and they put one in each pile. So you get these little sugya paragraphs that repeat verbatim in different tractates of Talmud. And you have to figure out what's the original location for that, and where is it peripheral. Right? It's more fun to use real intelligence. This is a human endeavor. Um, it's like you try and map the Talmud Sugiot the way you map the human genome. Yes. You, you see the patterns in the order and the way they go. Or James Joyce novel. Okay, here we go. So the Gemara digresses. Now we're going to talk uh, about the statement that a Amora said about Rebbe. Ready? Amar Rav, uh, Amar Rabba, Bere de Rava, the Itema Rav Hilo, Bere de Rav Valis. Why did we have this, it was this or this or that for that previous teaching? Because evidently it's a larger con, uh, concept. Mimot Mosheva Ad Rabbi, from the days of Moses until Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. Lo Matsinu Torah Ugdula Bemakom Echad. We don't find um, Torah and authority in one place, in one person. In other words, from the time of Moses to the time of Rabbi Yudha Nasi, for every step in between, there was never a time where Torah was the law of the land and there was a person in charge of the people who was a complete Torah scholar. King David was not a Moses. Where does King David ever tell you the laws of Sukkot? Nowhere. Where does King Solomon ever talk about Shabbat? Nowhere. Where does Hezekiah talk about the laws of marriage or purity and impurity? Nowhere. So even the greatest kings in the history of our people, there was never the Torah scholar philosopher king like Moses until Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. No, it's an Amora talking about it. So it's it's one of the next generation talking about their great rabbi. Uh, kings, they had all these rules, you know, about transforming. Did they do that? None of these rules. The, there are almost none of the rules of the Chumash present in the Book of Kings. The, the Book of yes, Kings the, never mentions Shabbat. The Book of Kings virtually never mentions the holidays. And when it does, it has different names for their months. Um, the Chumash uses Babylonian names for all the months, whereas the Book of Kings uses older Hebrew Canaanite names for four of the months, like Etanim. So from a literary standpoint, the logical conclusion is that the Book of Kings is older than the Chumash even though the Chumash is the events of Moses taking place 400 years before the middle of the Book of Kings, but that the literature of the Book of Kings is an older piece of written literature than the stories of Moses, that must they must have been written down mm -hmm. later. Now that's, for many people in Judaism, a heretical thought, that the Torah we have, as it is written, was not written before the, King, the Book of Kings, before the Book of Joshua, that the, right, 
it was not written by Moses. Because if it's later than Solomon, it couldn't have been written by Moses. But the Torah never claims that it's written by Moses. That's, a, that's tradition that says that. The Torah says, past tense, third person, and God spoke unto Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and tell them to do this, that, and the other thing. It's always third person about Moses and God. It's, and it's past tense, which means it's a third person after those people were talking who are relating an earlier conversation. So when did it get written? It doesn't make it any less holy to me if Joshua wrote it or Hezekiah wrote it or Ezra and Nehemiah wrote it or Jeremiah wrote it or a school of scribes coming out of the exile in Babylonia wrote it. If this, the stories can still be real. The testimony can still be true or not, right? But if you have a faithful interpretation that these are the real stories and the real words of the living God with Moses, who cares when it got written down, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I, and I challenge those same people. I say, what did God say to Noah? And they'll tell me what God said to Noah. And I'll say, how do you know? Noah didn't write it down. Moses wrote it down. And Moses wrote it down according to traditional counting a couple of thousand years after the event. And there's no record that there was a book that Noah handed down that Moses was working from. Moses wrote it down. So it's a third person, past tense record of an earlier conversation between God and another person. And you're perfectly willing to accept that as holy. So why can't that be somebody else writing about Moses if it can be Moses writing about them? Well, because God spoke it all directly to Moses. Well, then what's the book of Kings? Never says Solomon was told to write a book down, and yet we have a book, and you're saying that was revealed at Sinai too. Was it revealed to Moses? Now you're just making stuff up. <laughs> right? I mean, you're so committed to the concept that it was all revealed on Sinai that you're ignoring, you're, 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 you're ignoring both reason and literature. The testimony of the books themselves tell you where they came from for the most part. Just read the books, right? And, and accept their holiness and their divinity. I have no problem with that, but don't make something up because piety tells you to, right? That you're throwing reason aside. You know, God created you with a mind. You, you might want to use it. <laughs> well, because a mind is a terrible thing. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel Quayle. Because a mind is a terrible thing. Okay. Um, how are we doing? We've got 15 minutes. So let's say what this is. So the, the, whoever the Amora was says that from the time of Moses until the time of Rebbe, there was never a time when a Torah authority was in charge who was a Torah authority in charge. Okay? Basically, let's emphasize that. And, and now the Gemara goes, really? But what about Joshua? Hava Yehoshua. He was after Moses. He was a Torah scholar. And the Gemara says, Hava Elazar. Oh, I see. So now the question isn't, was there a Torah scholar who was in charge, but was there a solitary Torah scholar who was in charge. A time when he and he alone was the Torah scholar and was in charge. So Eleazar, right, the, the Kohen Gadol was also a Torah scholar at the time of Joshua. So they could, you know, like refer to each other and help each other or whatever. Vahava Pinchas. But there was Pinchas, even in the time of Moses, right? I mean, there's Pinchas. And, and, and well, Pinchas had the Zikanim, the elders, who were equal to Pinchas. Well, 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 have a Shaul. What about Shaul? He was a Torah scholar in his own generation, but no, have a Shmuel. He had the prophet Shmuel, who was also greater than Shaul in Torah scholarship, but was not in charge. But when Samuel, when Shmuel died, now you can't say that Shaul had Shmuel anymore. Shaul was now alone and preeminent because Shmuel's dead. <laughs> yeah, Shaul did go insane, murderously so, consorting with witches and hearing voices. 
Kulhu shnei ka'amrinan, but we meant, we meant that no person for all of his years was a solitary Torah scholar. But what about King David? Because there's nobody before, during, or after him, right? Well, Hava Ira Hayairi. Well, there was Ira the Yarite. I mean, everyone knows about Ira the Yarite. You've all heard of Ira the Yarite, haven't you? No, you haven't. Because who the hell is Ira the Yarite? We're going to save David and this Sugiya with Ira the Yarite? Look at the footnote. You have to go to the Gemara. Elsewhere in Talmud, in Moed Katan 16b, where David's teacher Ira sat on pillows and cushions when he would teach the rabbis, David among them. And it was evident from scripture in 2 Samuel 20, 26 that David deferred to Ira. So I am beyond curious to pull up the exact quote. 2 Samuel, what's the location? 19, chapter 19, verse 18. 